Hi and welcome to Add More Zest. My name's Rebecca, also known as 4Kids at 147. And today is another little tip that I actually got from a subscriber. Uh, it does have a combination of what I know many people do, but then it also has something a little bit extra. So many people will have what they call a trash pot when diamond painting. So they're in with their storage or separate, one or the other. They will have a little pot of some sort that they use to throw diamonds in that are not fit for the canvas. So they might have a bubble, they might be a little bit misshapen, but you don't want them on your diamond painting canvas. And they'll have a little trash pot in their storage which I've seen people do. Some people, you know, will just put them straight into a bin if that's maybe where they sit. Um, bin, trash, same sort of thing. Bin, garbage, that's it. I'm trying to think what word the Americans use for bin. Um, so basically, like a, an X. These are diamonds that you don't want to use. They're not fit for purpose. Ooh. Um, they're not fit for purpose and they can sit in there. Sometimes people like to know how many bad drills they've got in a kit. You know, if this gets quite full, they're not happy with the quality that's come from that supplier maybe. Some people just like to collect them up because why not? You know, they may as well sit there rather than anywhere else. So one tip is to have a trash or a bin pot. But this is the extra little added bit that a subscriber suggested to me, is provided their storage will allow them, or if you've got a, a setup that you can have on your desk that allow these to be permanent, is she has a second pot, and that is the mystery pot. Now, anybody that has been diamond painting for a while knows those little drills, they can get anywhere yeah they can appear on legs in bras under arms on <laughs> on the side of your hand you can get up from your chair and there's diamonds there and you're like how did they get there they can end up anywhere and what she does is any diamonds that are sort of found floating you know when she's finished diamond painting for the day or she just happens to find them, you know, maybe when you're diamond painting, you drop one and don't realise any of those. She puts them into the mystery pot. Now, this comes into its own if you do end up running out of any colours. So if anything happens where, you know, a supplier's not actually sent you enough, then she's got her mystery pot to see if she has any more of that colour available. Um, just to finish possibly that last little bit. We all have those rogue diamonds. I know I tended to just get rid of them and throw them, but this is a good idea, is to have a second pot that is just mystery. So you don't know what number it is, but you know it's probably come from that painting because you, that's what you're currently working on. And if you do ever find that you have become short of a diamond painting, then you can go to your mystery pot and see if you have a colour match. And you never know, it may give you that extra few diamonds that you need, um, especially if rogue diamonds appear in your life quite often. I know mine do. I often find them all the time on the couch. Because um, I, I work on an easel, sometimes I will sort of, if one gets dropped, it does end up on the couch and I, I'm not going to try and find where that little diamond went but it often appears when I get up at the end of the day um, and a mystery pot would be very handy for me with quite a few of my diamond paintings. So hopefully that will help some of you. But, and for tip and trick number 12 it is around using um, cover paper if that's what you prefer on a large painting. So you will have seen this painting probably a few times before. I've done it on whipping chats and I did do a tip and trick on how I sort of roll the painting up to help me um, 
to help it not squash flat, but me be able to work on it. But I don't like working with clear covers. The reason being for myself is if I was to pull this clear cover back and say start working here on this symbol, I would find myself doing this section but then I'd chase it up here and then I'd probably chase it up here and then I might go oh I've just got a few diamonds left in my tray and I'll just pull it back and I'll chase it up here and it's sort of like okay when do I stop? When do I stop and move further on with the painting? Um, yeah and that distracts me. I like to work on a section at a time so I like using cover paper. However, on a large painting that isn't, you know, just a size that I'm never going to roll. So if I, if I had a painting that I'm not going to roll that's 30 by 40, that's great. But for paintings that are big, that I need to roll it to work on my A3 easel, then I have another way of using cover paper. So I keep the clear paper on the rest of the painting and I only section off two rows okay so what I'll do is I'll start working for example down here I may peel off one section I may peel off two depends how much time I've got that evening how much I think I'm going to do I'll then take off this top one and I'll line it up so that I can still reach all the diamonds but that the section that I'm not going to do is cover is covered. I'm basically straightening it up, making it a bit neater. And then for this piece of paper, I will move it up and I'll put it up here. So I'm still using the same sh eight sheets of paper. I will move these up each section that I do until they're all done. And then I will trim the cover paper down again so that I don't have any hanging over so if you can imagine if I just do it on this half if I was then doing this one I'd then move this up and of course I would have done the whole row anyway but when I get to the point of moving this up this would actually be hanging over the top of the next piece so what I do is I trim it down and I get rid of that and I just put it in the bin and I move on so that is how you can make cover paper work on a big painting because if you use more, I find if you use more than like two rows, you know when you fold it with cover paper it pops up, you've got the chance of attracting dust and stuff and it definitely doesn't like to roll as much. It will stand a little bit of rolling but not a lot, it starts popping back up. So if I roll more than two, I find I end up with loads of gaps, whereas two is quite a nice strip. So I can roll this. I can roll that a little bit if I want to put it back in its box and the cover paper tends to be fine. But more often than not, I can just leave it like that when I'm done and the cover paper stays flat, but it's compact it can move over to the side and out the way and I'm just constantly using these sheets of cover paper which means I'm not using like all the cover paper I own on one painting that I'm not going to touch it's a great way to sort of recycle and move along as you go step by step and it doesn't use a whole load of cover paper you don't need to buy a ton to make a large painting work um, and because I'm working on, for example, this section, my eye doesn't wander to all of these up there because I'm focused on this block and what it is that I need to do in this section or indeed these two sections if I decide to do two. That's what I'll be focused on and I won't find, oh, oh, there's just one up there. There's just one up there. It doesn't happen. Um, partly because that is sort of the right sort of section that fits on my easel as well. A little bit of this hangs over and a little bit of that. But yeah, that's my tip for using cover paper with a large painting. 
so that you can still focus on what you need to focus on but leave the clear cover which is best for rolling on the painting that you've not done and then roll outwards with the diamond dots that, diamonds that you have dotted on the painting. And today is time for tip and trick number 13. Now this is one you've probably seen me use all the time and sometimes I forget for new diamond painters while they may see people using the likes of an easel. One, they may not know why I use an easel and second, it may not necessarily be something that's occurred to them before. So I'm trying to make sure that my tips and tricks incorporate those sorts of things as well. So this is an easel. This was actually gifted to me by a subscriber. And I didn't realise how much it was going to change my diamond painting life. I had always just diamond painted flat. Flat on my little table. It was always the way I did it. It took a little bit of getting used to using an easel. But oh my goodness, it made such a difference. So if you find that you diamond paint flat and you diamond paint for a while, you know, whether it be an hour or so at a time, you can find that you get a little bit of backache or neck ache from, of course, hunching over the diamond painting. And it is amazing how much of a difference this has made to that. I mean, I'm currently on quite a high worktop, which is what I have in my craft room. And I'm not leaning over as much as I would be if I was at, say, a dining table height table. Um, which is what my little table I use in front of the couch is. So the odd time that I do my heaven and earth designs and I work on it flat on camera, it's not too bad. But if I work on one flat on my little table, it's amazing how quick now I notice that my back and my neck and my shoulders and sort of down my back can ache and it's because my body has got used to sitting in a better position. So if you are thinking of diamond painting or staying diamond painting for a while, or you have, you know, the neck and, and back issues that are maybe stopping you from diamond painting as long as you want, then I highly recommend getting an easel. It does have a few different levels, so you can really have it quite high to be able to diamond paint. I tend to have it on the lowest one, though I have been known to put it higher. But I, the, the next one down is the one that actually lies it flat. So I tend to have it on the lowest, but you can have it a couple of, of higher. So if you think the camera is directly above me, so you can have it as high as pretty vertical without being vertical. And this will help your back ache or neck ache loads. Um, there are tables that you can get for doing diamond painting if you've got the space. As much as I would love one, I'm not willing to get rid of the dining table in order to have one, which is what I'd have to do. But you can get what they call drafting tables which give you a really, really big workspace that you can have on an angle for the purposes. You know, they're sold in hobby, sh hobby shops and things that you can get for diamond painting, but that's not suitable for everybody. Some people work on a small table like myself. Some people may work on a dining table or something like that. But I do highly recommend, if it's something that you can accommodate, getting an easel. If maybe you haven't, you know, got the space or you work with it, say, sat up in bed or something like that, you can get some cushions that are like a triangle. So you could put one part on your knee and still have the angle. Anything like that would work. Um, but yeah, it does make a huge difference. This one is A3 in size and I do work on all my diamond paintings with this. It does have a little lip so my diamond, my light pad will sit on there and allow me to work. I don't have my actual light pad in here but I do have a light pad in here. So this is a light pad for example that will just sit on there or I can put it upright depending on where I need the light to be. 
and it makes a huge, huge difference to the neck and the backache. Um, I will also be bringing you a tip on how you can make this bigger if you prefer to have a bigger diamond painting space to work on while still being able to use this as you know the A3 size. So a way that you can adapt an easel to take bigger paintings and smaller paintings if that's how you prefer to work. But stay tuned for my next tip and trick for that. But the tip and trick for today is all about getting yourself either an easel or something that will put your painting at an angle, depending on how you work. Um, if you are suffering from neck or back pain, it will make the world of difference. Um, if you go to my website, admorezest.com, there is a link there to one from the UK from the works that is £15, really quite reasonable for an easel. It's the one that my daughter Megan uses. After I was gifted this one, Megan decided that it was a good idea for her to get one as well. So we had a search UK wise and that's the one that we found and it's working perfect for her. Otherwise there are ones available on Amazon etc. So do just have a quick Google if you're in a different country and maybe put that on your, you know, Christmas list or just to treat yourself because you're worth it. And today it's time for tip and trick number 14. Now, in my last tip and tricks video, I did talk about getting an easel, which can be perfect for helping with potential neck or backache. Now, I know some people prefer if they're working on a larger diamond painting to feel as though the whole diamond painting is you know on the flat surface and for that the likes of an A3 easel which is of course a three size might not be big enough now there isn't I don't see the point in getting multiple easels for the purposes of different size diamond paintings when you can adapt your A3 easel to cope with the bigger painting if you wish. Now I do have a video which you can find on my website is the easiest place to find it. I do have a video on how I work on large paintings in which I have a section of it rolled here and then I drape it over the back of my easel and have a section rolled there. But I know some people, especially with paintings that may come out wider than the easel, to the right or to the left, prefer to have that supported. And if you do, this tip and trick is for you. Now, you can use something a lot posher than I am because this is to hand, which is why I'm using it. But this is a flat cardboard box. Now you can imagine this being, it could be a thin piece of wood, if you have, you know, sheets of plywood or something floating about in, say, your, your garage. It could also be, you can get sheets of mount board, so it's, it's like very thick cardboard. In fact, it's very similar to a cardboard box, but it looks nicer. And you can pick those up for a couple of pounds. You may decide to get an A2 sheet of mount board, which is bigger than the A3 size that we have here. And you can use that A2 piece of mount board. Now, because um, an easel tends to have a ledge, while you're going to use your diamond, your light pad, for example, and that will take up some of that ledge, you don't want something that is as thick as the ledge to make your easel bigger, because then where's your light pad going to rest? Could become tricky. But mount board is probably the most ideal slash cheapest option. But if you have wood in your garage, then that's even cheaper, isn't it? Because it's free. But I'm going to use this cardboard box as an example. And the idea is that you would sit the bigger piece on your easel, which gives you where you can see where the edge is. You've got all this to one side. I've got the same amount, if not a little bit more, to the other side that would allow me to put a much bigger diamond painting on here without any of the sides sagging over 
and that makes my whole easel bigger and then I can still have my light pad there without it coming off the edge. Um, it would get, you know, the corners might get a bit bashed over time but compared to the cost of a piece of mount board which is normally two to three pounds I think you've got you're going to get a lot more use out of it if that's the way you prefer to do it you can of course get one sort of taller there will become a point depending on the size where the easel um you know is is the physics is going to make it tip one way or another especially if you're going upright there is going to be that tipping point physics dictates that there is but you should get a big enough area um you know double if not more the size of the a3 to be able to fit a large diamond painting on it and give you a work area that you can all reach from one place quite easily and i say mount board is probably the best option it's a little bit lighter than wood it's still thin enough for you to get your light pad on but what you can also do if you do find that this is moving and this is somebody that a subscriber suggested to me that what they did is basically you can get some strip velcro now i don't have strip velcro so i'm good i have some little dubs of velcro but that's not going to show this perfectly so the idea is i'm going to use a tape measure so the idea is that you would put on your easel some strips of velcro going this way so say maybe one two three maybe something like that three strips of velcro going that way and then on your mount board piece of wood box whatever it is that you've got you would put velcro going down this way in sort of three sections they could even just be a little bit further in and then once you popped velcro to velcro because you've got one lot going that way and one lot going that way you don't have to match it up exactly because it would fit on those three points and it would fit on those three points on the strips that you've already got there and that will give you enough support that you're not going to go to put a diamond on and you know try and nudge it into place and send your box flying or something like that and um, that could give you the security to keep you know your bigger easel together however still allow you to peel it off when you're working on a smaller painting and you don't want the extra big part because your painting's only this big and that will still allow you to then of course put you know your painting on a light pad now that only really works if you work on a light pad only because if you took that cover off you'd need to bear in mind that if you went back to a normal easel it would have velcro on it which would give you bumps now you could cut down a piece of mount board to exactly the same size as your easel and use that as your second alternative if you don't use a light pad you can also use it with your light pad so you could have again velcro going this way on your easel but going this way on the back of your light pad so then you could position your light pad here and it would pick up on these two pieces or if you have a small light pad you could choose to stick your light pad higher up on the two strips of velcro and give you your light area further up your painting so there you go you've actually got two tricks tricks in one there um, by using velcro on your easel your light pad and or your piece of mount board you could give yourself you know extra size and ability to move a smaller light pad around your workspace if that's what you prefer and then you know you could have a piece of mount board the size of your painting and you could even put velcro on your mount board as well on the front to allow you to move your light pad up and down if you only have a smaller one but i hope those sort of two combined into one i hope i've made sense with it um 
just remember if you do end up with multiple layers of Velcro, make sure you've got, you know, your hoops and your soft part will actually match up so that it sticks. Two soft parts of Velcro won't work and two hoop parts won't work either. You could use the likes of command strips if you're, you know, not wanting to remove them as much, but I would go for the likes of standard Velcro if you want it to be a more movable, movable option. Anyway, and today is tip and trick number 15. Now, this is one you've probably seen me use in the past. But when you have diamond paintings that you need to store, some people will store them under mattresses, under rugs to keep them flat, things like that. But the, the one that I like to use is a trouser hanger. So one of the hangers with these clips on the bottom, these are picked up from the range as like a two pack but they do have, over the metal, they have like a grip that helps to hold on. Um, Say so they do come as a two pack, but I label mine up into sort of sections. So these are my special diamond paintings and I have quite a few on there. You can sort of tell when it gets to the weight where the hangers had enough and you will find that they'll move a bit. Um, I tend to keep up to a maximum of about a 30 by 40 or maybe a 40 by 50 on them. I also have one for round. This one is a lot fuller, as you can see, but it's still it's still holding. I sort of hold it up and give it a little, little shake and see what happens. If they come off, then I need to move to another hanger. And then I also have one as well for square. There's not as many square on there either at the moment. You can even use these for really big diamond paintings. Because I am lucky enough to have a craft space, albeit a small one, I hang them up on the wall in my craft room. And because of that, I am limited on how wide I can do them and how long they can be because they are hung up near my desk. But if you had, maybe if you were lucky enough to have a craft room and had an open wall, you could potentially hold ones that were a lot longer and even wider. You could also, if you are short of space and maybe don't have a craft room, you could hang up your diamond paintings and pop them in one side of your wardrobe maybe to keep them safe. There are a few different options of places you can hang these, but I find these perfect because I, I can flip through, you know, flip through these and say, oh, okay, I want to do this one next. And I can just hold one of these and sort of pull the diamond painting out and then lift up the other one pull the diamond painting out, all the rest stay on the hanger and I have my next diamond painting. Whichever way sort of works for you. If, if You know, many people do store them flat under a bed maybe or some people do it under a mattress but I like this way because they all look pretty on my wall as well which is always a bonus my labels are just for ease because i do have a few different diamond paintings that i might need to find but anyway that is my tip and trick number 15 use hangers to hang up your diamond paintings that you've not yet done Today, um, for tips and tricks number 16, I thought I would show you how I personally store my bigger diamond paintings. I did go through on tip 15 what I tend to use for my smaller ones, 30 by 40, etc. And while they can be used for big ones, um, the clothes hangers, they can be used for big ones just as much as for small ones but it doesn't work for me due to the space that I can hang them in they can't really be extremely tall if I actually put them in a wardrobe I would probably get away with a few of these actually being stored on a hanger 
but they're not, so I can't. So I have a couple of different ways that I store them. So the likes of Diamond Art Club, quite often I leave them in the box. So I've had them out for an unboxing, but then I just leave them in there. So that's People's Princess that I've not done yet. I'm even storing Minions inside the box, which is one that I am still currently working on. It is stored inside the box, rolled outwards for the part that has diamonds on it, rolled inwards for the part that doesn't. And if you can see there, both of them actually have a piece of pipe insulation, to use the right word, rather than pipe lagging, which is what I call it. Um, they actually have a piece of that inside to help it to not squish in on itself to keep a circle form. So that actually goes in and out like that because there's no diamonds in that one. That is purely canvas. Um, often many of the likes of Diamond Art Club and I've also got a Dreamers Designs down here. I tend to try and keep the diamonds in with those as they've come packaged because they're poured glue they can cope with just being in the box. Then I do have some others that are poured glue but didn't come in a box. The likes of my unordered lines. That This one is actually from DIY Choose. I actually ordered this from two different companies. So one did go in a giveaway. The other one is here with me. And for that one, I just keep it rolled up. So I've unpackaged it and rolled it rather than it, it being a bit squashed around diamonds. And then I do still have my label on it. And then I've got labeled up the diamonds. I use these mini little bulldog clips and I just make sure I clip the edge and then I fold them over. And that's just to keep it rolled up as a tube. Now you can roll them round the likes of some pipe lagging or a pool noodle if you wish. I find it's not as important when there's not any diamonds on it because it's actually the weight of the diamonds that start to squish the canvas. When there's no diamonds on there, it's not as big a deal. I have quite a few that are stored like that and they just go in my calax which is under this desk they stick out a little bit but they just go in one of my calax squares and it just looks like a, a whole hodgepodge of of canvases but it works for me I have some completed canvases on like one little shelf in my calax and then I have uncompleted ones on my bottom little shelf and that's where what I call my large paintings go and then there or in boxes staying in boxes and then my smaller ones go on the hangers so hopefully that's that's a helpful way for some people that are wondering how to store their big canvases now at the moment I don't have any big ones that are double-sided tape so they're all poured glue with this clear cover at the moment. If you need to store a painting that is double-sided tape and it is a big one, my suggestion is don't flatten it out when you first get it. Keep it rolled. You know, by all means, peel back a corner of the cover to check the symbols look nice you know, and that you're not going to have any problems with the clarity or the print quality on the canvas. But don't unravel it all. If anybody has actually seen me work on my Heaven and Earth designs, so this is one that is actually, this canvas is probably the only canvas, the only big, big canvases that I have that are double-sided tape. I have... Apart from unrolling it to measure it, I have never actually flattened this part of the canvas. 
I've never pulled it all the way out, peeled back the cover and flattened it back down. It's never been done. It's always stayed rolled. I did unravel some of the first section of it when I got it, but then I worked on it flat anyway. Um, so this is stayed rolled. And again, it stayed rolled the way it came, so outwards in this instance. And then it gets rolled with the diamonds outwards. And that actually goes on one of my Kallax units as well. I've also got the famous pipe lagging in both of those, though they're not the same size as you can tell. Um, and that just helps. I mean, this one, I, it's two and a half meters long, so it's a lot of canvas. Um, and of course, this one has had diamond paintings on it, diamonds put on it. So it just keeps both of them in its right form. And then when I get to do it, I bring it, unroll whatever section I need and roll it back up. But as I say, because I've never peeled it all back and put it all back down again, it doesn't seem to cause a problem with this canvas at all. So I find that a great way to store them. You could, you know, stand them all upright maybe in a, in like a magazine holder or get a bin, a plastic bin. Why won't the camera focus? Focus. Okay, let's put something else in the screen. Um, you could stand them all upright in like a magazine holder or an empty bin and, and have them all stood up that way. Or you could have them all laid down like I do. I don't think it really matters whether it's upright or laid down. Just happens to be the way my craft room set up is the best way for it. Maybe putting them stood up would work better for you. But hopefully that helps on how I store my large canvases or my larger canvases. Um, today is time for tip and trick number 17. Now for those that have followed my channel for a while quite possibly would have seen me use these before. Um, I have done a video on it before but not in my 100 hopefully tips and tricks. Um, but this is how I store paintings that I've done but don't have a space on a wall in my home for example or I haven't yet found say the, the right person to give them to. I love to use these display folders. Now the display folders I pick up from the range in the UK for the grand sum of £3.99 so they don't cost a lot at all and to accompany that I purchased um, a pack of cardstock a3. They do it in white and black. I chose the white, so uh, the black, sorry. Um, so this is the cardstock that I've chosen. 210 GSM, 25 sheets. Again, this is also 3.99. So it doesn't cost a lot. And then a bit of double-sided tape, which you can pick up for say a pound. So nine pounds, you can get yourself a display book started to be set up. I now currently have three. So I have two that hold my portrait, or sometimes, like in this case, square. So this is a portrait one. So I have two that hold portraits, and then I have one that holds landscape. They come with 20 sort of inserts, just the, the plastic side of things. I have actually taken out 10 of them. Have I done it on this one? Maybe I've not done it yet on this one. Okay, on my other ones, I have taken out 10 of the actual pages from the middle. The only reason being is by the time I put in the diamond paintings, it ends up being like this big. So I chose to take out some of the inside pages and I just chopped them out with scissors which allowed it to fill up to sort of a nicer amount. Let me see if I can grab hold of it. So this is my full one. So it doesn't get too much thicker than the book itself by taking out those middle ones, because of course, by the time you add the cardstock and the diamonds, it can get full. So what I do is I use a single piece per painting. Now you could do it double-sided and decide to, you know, put a painting on each side. But I choose to do single because if I ever then want 
to frame this one, for example, or gift this one, I can just take this one out. Um, this is a true 30 by 40 painting. Now for a true 30 by 40 to fit in an A3 book, you do need to take off two rows of diamonds, which can either come one side, each one each side, or two from one side, depending on what your picture is. Um, not ideal, but also not necessarily a bad thing, because quite often if you get a frame that is made to fit a 30 by 40 painting, you actually have a bit more than two rows of diamonds that tends to make the edge of the frame. So those diamonds would have been hidden anyway, so it doesn't stop me from framing any. I can just take out this piece of card and actually get an A3 frame and frame it up directly in that, especially if you like to change your images. Maybe you have an A3 frame that you put up and you change them over every now and then. Um, I also have ones that are poured glue, so it's down as a 30 by 40, but actually ends up being smaller because of the border for the actual canvas. Um, this one's got special diamond paintings in it. These again, were true, were 30 by 40s, but with the border from the canvas. And what I do is I just cut down the outside with a pair of scissors, cut it all off, a couple of strips of double-sided tape and stick it down in the middle. I know there are some people that will, you know, make little plaques for them to, to name the painting maybe, or you can add information to the back of the, the cardstock uh, especially if you use a single sheet per diamond painting, you might want to make a little note on the back to say what it is that you did. Um, so, for example, we sell these stickers in the shop, so you can do the, the title, the date you started, you finished, where you purchased it from, and any little notes, and just stick that sticker. You could choose to stick it on, the actual front but the size of it you're probably best just sticking it on the back and then if anybody does ask that information is there and ready um, you may have it all in your logbook as well but I've got quite a few paintings in here now that don't particularly have a home these two were both true 30 by 40s um, but I find this an ideal way for you to still be able to look through your diamond paintings, have a nosy. I can change out which ones on the front as and when the mood takes me. And it's not hugely expensive. I've even got one I'm not that keen on. That was a mystery one. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a nice way to store them, to be able to flick through, see what paintings you've done in the past. And yeah, especially if you can make a frame to sort of change them out into so that you can, you know, see them in your day-to-day -day life all the time as well. But I find these absolutely fantastic for storing the smaller completed paintings. Um, I do have my bigger ones in a couple of places. And I will sort of go through how I store them in another tips and tricks. But this is how I store my completed smaller paintings and hopefully it will help you. Uh, I do have links to the display book on my website so under favourites I'm pretty sure it's on there under storage I'm pretty sure I've linked the card stock as well. It doesn't work for every country because the range is only available in the UK but it will at least give you details of what you need to search for in your own country. So it may help you with sizing and all that sort of stuff. You can also get them bigger. If you've got the space to store them, you can get them for your bigger paintings as well. And this is tip and trick number 18. So during tip and trick number 17, I showed you my display book that I use to store smaller paintings. This is what I use to store my bigger paintings. So these I tend to use for my completed. I tend to find, um, as, you, as you will have seen in the past, um, for storing paintings that aren't yet completed, I prefer to hang up the smaller ones and roll up the big ones. I find that that works. I find that I've got easier access to them. You could use this 
for paintings that aren't yet completed as well. But this is where I put any completed painting that won't fit in my display book. So anything bigger than sort of 30 by 40. So I have a 40 by 40 um, because the book is not wide enough for that. It is just short of 30 centimetres. Um, in the width, I have a 50 by 50. I'm trying to think what else I have in here. But this is an A1 art folder. So I've turned it round to upside down. It, I got one that was a little bit thicker than some that you can get, but basically it's a thick plastic. You can get leather bound ones and all sorts. I have I have some in here that are 50 by 50, so the tree. This one's 40 by 40. Face, oh that's another tree, because I did have some of these in a 50 by 50 frame in my front room. I have this 50 by 50, the very colourful African woman, I did that one ages ago. Um, I have my Christmas one, so this normally goes into my 50 by 50 frame at Christmas time, and then I trade it out for another one throughout the rest of the year. Um, and yeah, they're all stored flat in here, and of course I pulled out all the biggest ones. Um, but this is an A1 artist's folio, and this slides under my couch. So that's where I tend to keep my paintings that are big. It enables me to keep them flat. I did have it propped up at one point, sort of down the side of a couch or down the side of a cabinet. However, because of the weight of the diamonds, they did curl a little bit. Um, this one was actually in there when it did. So it's flattened out again since I put them flat instead but I don't recommend having them upright because the weight of the diamonds and the fact that the canvas is flexible will cause them to sort of buckle down on themselves a little bit. I did look at getting, you know, maybe a leather posher A1 folio. And even though that they can be a little bit more rigid than this tough plastic, I don't think they'd be rigid enough to have it upright. So for me, this goes under my couch. It could go under a bed. You know, there are many, many items in the house that you could probably slip something thin underneath um, that is also big. It does depend, of course, on your home. But the couch works for me, and that's good because it means I don't have to go upstairs to put a painting away. Um, because it fits where it needs to. So this is my primary place for any big diamond paintings. Of course, I do still have some paintings that are even too big for that. Um, for those, I tend, and I'm trying to find where it is, I tend to put them um, back in the storage tube. Not always, but I try to. Um, I do have, and I can't quite locate where I put the tube, um, but I do have a really long diamond painting from Ever Moment. Um, so I've stored those in the postal tube that it came in. But you can actually buy tubes. They're used by like planners and drafters. So you can buy plastic tubes if you have a painting that is too long to go in one of these A sto A1 storage, or you can use the original box. So I do have a couple of Diamond Art Club ones, for example, that I finished that I just rolled around my famous, or not famous, my ever popular use of pipe lagging or pipe insulation, as it's called in other countries. Um, you also get some, sometimes get a smaller version of this in a kit, but I wrap them round this so that the diamonds don't fold in on each other or squeeze down on each other. And then I pop this then inside a box or a tube to keep it protected. 
and that works for some of my much larger paintings that don't have a home at the moment but I don't want to get rid of them because you know you move you redecorate all of a sudden you find the perfect spot for that diamond painting that you love and had to do um, but didn't have anywhere to put it so um, yeah a piece of pipe lagging or say piece of foam pull noodle just wrap it round with your diamonds facing outwards because if you face them inwards they will squish against each other and potentially pop off so that keeps it protected that way. If you took this out, for example, over time, the diamonds would weigh down and you would end up squashing the painting, which in turn could give you lines when you unroll it. So I always suggest any large paintings that you completed, roll around something and then pop in maybe a brown postal tube or you can get some tough plastic, you know, architects tubes that they'd normally put big plans in if you want to go a bit posher you could have some of those but I tend to use this A1 artist folio underneath my couch as the primary storage for any painting over 30 by 40 that needs a temporary home until it's found a permanent one so I hope that helps you on storing your completed diamond paintings as well as the past tips and tricks on storing diamond paintings that you've not yet done and it's time for tip and trick number 19 so this is in relation to a diamond painting that you may get for your stash so it's one that you're not planning on necessarily doing straight away but it is one that you want to do in the future. So I have this painting. Um, I don't even know if I've done the unboxing for it yet. <laughs> I know I've done the video for it yet. I don't know if it's been shown. But this is a painting that I do want to keep hold of. So I'm going to go through the way that I do it. As you've seen from previous videos, I store my diamonds differently to how I store my canvases. So I use these stickers. Now these are ones available from the shop that just give details about the painting itself. You don't have to use these, you could make up your own or you could use a very very simple number system. So if you didn't have any paintings in your stash you would put number one on this, number one on this. So one and one and then you could just go through all the numbers so that your diamonds have numbers on them, your canvases have numbers on them and they match up. You could even use the canvas number if it has one. So this one has YX3887. You could do the same and label. I mean the diamonds have it on anyway but you could make a clearer label so that you can keep them separately. I like to do this just because I find the words and the names easier. Plus, you know, if, if the numbers aren't, if, as soon as I start taking out number five and number five, number 12 and all the rest of it, part of me would want to fill those gaps again and it could potentially get confusing. So I'm going to give a name to this one. I'm actually going to call this one Bride because that's what I see it as. I see it as a potential framed wedding gift type painting. So I'm going to call it Bride and I'm going to put that on both, on two stickers. Then it's down as a 30 by 40. I know it's a little bit smaller than that, but to me 30 by 40 is plenty. And then let me find out who I got it from. Okay, I so should have done that beforehand. Uh, it is from Fan Cells, I did think it was but I didn't want to write it and then you find an unboxing on it on something else later. So, <laughs> fan cells. And then this one is a special diamond painting. So I actually have three check boxes. The reason I also do that is I store my diamonds according to their shape and style. So I store these as 
These all go in with special diamonds. Now, for special diamonds, I don't put them in any other packaging than what they came in, pretty much, unless they came in bits. So all my special ones just go in a plant pot holder from Ikea with diamonds special on it. And any painting that's a special diamond painting, my diamonds will be in here. And I'll just go through and look for the name that makes sense to me. I like to put the company it's from because I do a lot of, you know, videos and things like that. That's my reference to where it came from and I like that. I put the size, I say, and then I put what type. So the two main things that I use is the fact that it is a bride. So I can go searching for a label that says bride to find the diamonds and the fact that it's a special diamond painting. Some people, as I say, use numbers. Some people use the canvas numbers. Some people even like to keep both the diamonds and the painting together and they may keep it in the original packaging. I prefer to give them chance to go flat a little bit. So this one was quite curled up. I actually just put two of my spare diamond painting boxes on it to weigh it down and that's got pretty flat to me. If I was going to frame this and gift it, which I may still do, then I might run an iron over the back of it before I put the diamonds on just to help some of these little creases go out. But this can now go on one of my hangers to hang up as a diamond painting that's ready to go. Um, for some of them, I do use these bags. So I like the little, these are fabric, re, not fabric, they're plastic. So they're like reinforced plastic, reusable little zip up pouches. This one is labeled for a painting that I'm about to kit up. The, the labels do tend to peel off these quite easy. So I just reuse these again and again, and they line up nicely in my box. Um, so, in fact, let me get the rounds because I tend to have a lot smaller rounds. So all my rounds are lined up in the small ones here. And then I do have some of the bigger pouches depending on the actual canvas. Because, of course, the big canvases won't always fit in the small ones. But that's what I store my round diamonds in. And then I do have one for squares as well. Though most of my squares are bigger. So a lot of my squares are actually in the A5 pouches and then I do have one extra big pouch um, and I have one little small one but most of them are in bigger pouches for square but it's very easy for me to find the ones that I want. So yeah that is that. I'm going to add this one to my diamond painting log book stash. Let me find my log book. I'm going to add it to here because I've just recently got all this sorted. So this one is called Bride and this one is a 30 by 40. So that's now added into my stash which means it can go away and I've got reference to everything that I've got. So quick tip for you today, hopefully that is helpful for some of you that are wondering what to do. We've gone through pretty much storing with the tips and tricks, storing your diamond paintings prior to painting, after painting, but there's many, many more tips and tricks to come. So do stay tuned. And today I'm bringing you tip and trick number 20 and this is in relation to placing mainly square diamonds it can be used with round diamonds but it definitely makes square diamonds a lot easier to place now i have already placed a row of single diamonds and i'm going to start to place the next row so before i do this method on any painting I do like to have myself a little, let's try and get that one to fit in. Uh, I do like to have myself a border. And that is just around the edges of the painting. 
I'm not bothered about having one on the inside in any way. I don't necessarily make myself a little square, though you could do. So let's just go across and make ourselves a little square and we'll fill in this little square with my sort of tip for using squares. Now this is a well-known tip used by quite a few different people. Quite a few people get on with this tip and use this one. I actually have two different tips for working with squares and the next one will be number 21. I'm losing track of where I'm up to with, with numbers. But we've got a set of diamonds placed so we've got our little square and one of the tips is to actually do a checkerboard method so what you do is you do every other square now you have to take a little bit more care when you're doing every other square you want to try and get them lined up so this is the slow part so you pop a diamond in every other square taking a little bit more care going a little bit slower or you know slow and steady you don't have to panic about them being hugely straight though as straight as you can get them is ideal and you do every other one in a block this of course works best with block paintings or block sections of colour more so than little bits but you can work them on on tiny size blocks as well as huge size blocks <clears throat> until you end up with a little checkerboard sometimes I like to do this pattern so for example on this full section I'll do my straight line all the way up here and then what I'll do is I'll actually go in a diagonal and then I'll come down and I'll sort of let it bounce off the sides a bit like that Atari game. It used to be, excuse me, it used to be around quite a few years ago um, and I'd bounce it up and down just for a little bit of difference until I found that I had every other square done. Once that's done, you then get the quicker part which is filling in the gaps. And what you find happens when you do this is as you're pushing each diamond in to your gap, and this works especially well if you've got some really nice quality, nice fitting diamonds, is it will straighten up the diamonds that you've already placed around it as well. So if they're a little bit off kinker, you know, they're a little bit not straight, um, then by pushing these in and, and quite often get in a nice click when you do, that normally means you've nudged a diamond over a little bit. You get a little click, they all nudge in and you end up with an extremely nice block of diamonds all done that don't tend to have many gaps. I mean, there's the odd tiny but I can't even really see them um, so I don't know if you guys can but checkerboard can be a very fun way to do a block of plain colour I say you just go off on a tangent in little um, diagonals maybe all the way across or maybe you do it like I did every other one going all the way and then once you've done that section then you can just go filling in all the dots quick as anything until the job is done. So I hope that's helpful for somebody who's starting with squares. I know I have done a video in the past and it is available um, on my YouTube. Easiest way to find it is a link on my website. I do quite a few different tips on doing a square diamond painting all in one video, but I did also want to break them down so that people can find the individual ones if they just want to figure out that one tip. So, Thank you so much for watching and I'll speak to you all again soon.